this message is entitled The Value of Pressure. The Value of Pressure. Who's under pressure right now? Raise your hand. That should be everybody. There's good pressure and there's not so good pressure. And so we'll deal with that. For our scripture reading, we're in the book of Mark chapter number 2. Uh, Mark chapter number 2 verse 4. Mark chapter number 3 and verse 9. And when they could not come near to him because of the press, They couldn't come near to him. Not that he was not available. They could not get to him because of the press. I was at a shop the other day and uh, there was a very long line. And uh, I don't see myself as a senior citizen, even though I'm going to be 66. And apparently I am. So the teller said to me, ah, Bishop, come to the front. So somebody was chingering, so they said, but this man, he's 65. He's a senior citizen. I said, ah, in that case, let's go. <laughs> and so there are times in your life when you're trying to get in front. You're trying to get to the Lord, but you can't because of the press. Everyone say pressure. They uncovered the roof where he was, and when they had broken it up, they broke somebody's house. They let the bed down with the man that was paralyzed. Chapter 3 and verse 9. And he spoke to his disciples that a small ship should wait on him because, the, because of the multitude, lest they should throng him or squash him. For he had healed many in as much as in so much that they pressed upon him to touch him and as many as had plagues were trying to touch him unclean spirits when they saw him they fell down before him and cried and said you are the son of God and finally from the book of Mark chapter number 5 verse 27 And when she heard of Jesus, when she heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I'll be made whole. And straightway the fountain of blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned about in the press, turned in the pressure, and said, someone touched my clothes. And the verses say that he said to the lady, be it done unto you as you have believed. Father, add a blessing to this word. Pressure is built into the system. We cannot live in this world without pressure. There's pressure that's essential for you to function even where you are right now. And so let's deal with the, the human being. We are spirit, Genesis chapter number 1, verse 26. We are made in God's image, and we are made after his likeness. So everything that you produce in your life, everything, from your schoolwork in school, to your, should you marry your home and your children, your business, your ministry, everything you do is made in your image and is after your likeness. And so if I want to know a person or people, 
I'll visit their house because what's in their house is an immediate extension of them. It's made in their image and it's after their likeness. If I want to know how a family runs, I want to get around the children because the children are in your image and they are after your likeness. This church is made in my image, it's after my likeness. If I don't like what I see in this church, I have to change my image and I have to change my likeness. If you don't like your world, you definitely have an imaging problem. A lot of people cannot look at themselves in the eye, in the mirror, because you don't like your image. And when you don't like your image, it impedes your likeness. You are not likable because you do not have a, a suitable likeness. Are you tracking with me so far? So we start with your spirit. When Adam was made a spirit being, God built him a body, Genesis 2 verse 8, and gave him the breath of life and he became a living soul. He became a living soul. So the soul came last. The spirit was first, the body was second, the soul was third. It was added. But in the order in which we, we now are dealt with, we are dealt with spirit, soul, and body. The spirit is invisible. It's generally uh, located in the belly area, right here. The spirit is located here. Jesus said, out of your belly, John 7, 38 and 39, will flow rivers of living water, which means that the spirit is in this area here. This area. The soul is in this area here. Let me go back to the spirit. The spirit is also synonymous with what is called the heart. The heart. Not the physical pump, but the heart. Out of the abundance of the, the what? The mouth speaks. So the heart and the spirit are synonymous in most places in the scripture. Your heart and your spirit are one and the same thing. And so sometimes a person that has a dark heart or a dark spirit are very dangerous. When a person is possessed by a devil, it, they are possessed not in their soul, they are possessed in their spirit. The spirit takes occupation in your house. The soul is located in this area, the head. It's the mind. It's your mechanism of decision making. It's the area of the emotion. You feel, you think, you make decisions. It's the seat of your will. And the body is this. So we are spirits. We have a soul. We live in a body. So when God deals with you, he speaks to you in your spirit. Your spirit will then translate that message into your mind. Your mind will then give an instruction for your body to move in certain directions. If your soul is not whole, it will misread a message that God is sending you. If your spirit is dead, what God sends you cannot be translated into an actual force of action for success. The devil cannot speak into your spirit. He can possess it and influence it, but he will use your mind to get access to your heart. And so he'll use your mind through what is called the five senses, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. 
And so he'll put things before your eyes, before your ears, your touch, so that what you've experienced with your senses in your soul influences what you allow into your spirit. And so confession of the word daily feeds the spirit. Information that you are gathering from news channels and books, uh, whatever the case might be, is feeding your mind, your soul. And food, physical food, feeds your body. All of those things are important and must be balanced. We spend way too much time in the soulish realm. Too much time in the soulish realm. And our prayers in the soulish realm are not even decent because we tend to give God a shopping list as opposed to praying in the spirit. Be filled with the spirit. Let your spirit be renewed. Let your spirit be awakened. Paul said your mind so must be transformed. It must be renewed. And then your body must be brought under subjection. We crucify the flesh. It must be brought under subjection. All of those three entities functioning collectively on a daily basis creates a significant amount of pressure. And that pressure is needful for you to be a successful Christian and a believer. If you do not take time to grow spiritually, you'll never fully realize and experience the things that God has for you. Turn to a person and say, pressure is good for you. And so the whole man, the whole woman, the whole woman has got to be worked on. And you have to insist. They are things that you have to insist in your life that have to happen. You have to pray. You have to read your Bible. You have to force yourself to worship. You have to force yourself to be in church and be in fellowship. Those things are essential. You have to make yourself. You have to. Because if you don't, something else will compete for your time. So, Let's now deal with uh, pressure as an entity. Uh, pressure is the force applied perpendicular to a surface of an object per unit area over which that force is distributed. So, for example, pressure at sea level is 14.7 pounds. That's about six and a half or seven kilograms per square inch pressure. Pressure uh, is uh, the pressure relevant to an ambient pressure. And so uh, all pressure where I'm standing now against my body is equal. All pressure is equal. All the air pressure. And that Equal pressure allows my, my lungs, uh, my veins, uh, my digestive system to function normally. Or else, uh, if there was unequal pressure, it could actually either crush me or it would cause me to explode because the internal pressure may hurt me. And so because of external pressure, it then helps govern the functions of your body. And so every person in this room has a blood pressure. And a normal blood pressure is anywhere between 120 to 70. We'll come to that in a minute. If your blood pressure is higher than 140, uh, that's the top number, and very low on the low number, below, let's say, 70 or 60, then you have a challenge with blood pressure. And high blood pressure will kill you because what high blood pressure does, 
it begins to expand your heart it expands your heart and your heart then cannot perform in an adequate way to get resources to the furthest part of your body and so blood pressure is essential that it's managed well without making a negative confession uh if you have a a blood pressure issue just raise your hand don't play with that don't play with it Be- because if you miss medication i know jesus heals that's a no brainer but jesus had a doctor traveling with them dr luke so we won't deal with that dynamic don't mess with with things that are preventable a really really good friend of mine is dying right now because he refused to consult a doctor for uh, annual checkups and he has prostate cancer that's now gone to stage 4 and now they asking for prayer and asking if there's a doctor that can help him well at stage 4 we're not sure uh you might have to go for chemo or radiation or whatever the case might be but what was preventable has now caused him a massive challenge and he's now almost paralyzed and in a wheelchair and so pressure uh must be managed well pressure from life if not managed it's called stress can destroy you who's under pressure don't be under the kind of pressure where it's going to stroke you out and so you have to balance pressure from life balance pressure from lack balance pressure from the economy balance pressure from being in demand balance pressure from not getting a phone call to 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 be on a platform uh all of those areas that create pressure in your life can actually cause you to stroke out and so let's deal with some common things women are interesting beings for for all kinds of reasons but but let me deal with one area for women you know a young lady at the age of 27 starts freaking out because they come into the age of 30 and uh they somehow think that at 30 years of age they old and i'm 30 i'm not married you know i'm not going to have a child you know and put themselves under unnecessary pressure i mean you think that god is is uh, you know worried that you 27 i mean what about somebody that's 72 it's just the numbers sh- shifted so i mean you 27 so what don't put yourself under pressure unduly or the lady say amen. amen amen a man is like a combi you miss this one there's another one that's just gone off the road on its way amen if you're going to get on that combi make sure that combi is at least washed and the seats are in place there's pressure not having money a lot of pressure because there are things that you can do that you are unable to because of a lack of money but there's as much pressure even more pressure with having money because of the pull on your life the pressure from people who need things from you and if you have an occasion where you are blessed to have abundance you have to put in structures and systems so that when the press comes it doesn't cause you to be crushed there is pressure being gifted what was that chicky's name i can't remember her name in the american olympic team the gymnast an african american young lady that won a gold medal just a young young lady that 
performed extremely well. And then the journalists, the press, were asking her questions in areas that she had not matured and grown up in, asking her about issues of human rights and gender rights and civil rights. Let the kid enjoy her gold medal. She's been sacrificing from when she was a little girl. Give her a moment to enjoy the spotlight. Don't politicize her win. Are we together? And so the thing is that there's pressure on the girl that came second. We don't even know what's her name or where she's from. But can you imagine putting in as much or if not more pressure and still comes second? She doesn't get the sponsors. She doesn't get the TV, doesn't get the interviews. And so now she has to wait another four years for an Olympic Games that her country may boycott because of the war in Russia and Ukraine that's not been resolved. And so there's added pressure because now she's lost eight years to go to an event that's not happening. Everyone say pressure. And so one of the things we, we need to uh, focus on in our lives, formally and then subformally or subliminally or informally, is the entity of pressure. Turn to your neighbor and say, you have to handle pressure. You have to handle pressure. And so I'm not a movie person, but I stumbled on a movie. Uh, I was looking for something, but I stumbled on a movie uh, of a German submarine that had gone down. And there was an American, this was in the Second World War, an American submarine that was having challenges with its engine, had to go and uh, try to release a team to salvage the engine from the German U-boat submarine so that they could put it in their submarine to get to the surface. And so, because it was so deep down in the ocean, the pressure of water, I mean, you, you put water in your hand, it feels like it's harmless. But for every 10 meters you go beneath the surface, the, the pressure of water increases by 100%. So that when you get to the very bottom of the ocean, depending on how deep the trough is, even a submarine will be crushed on every side. And so if you imagine Jonah, the reason God put Jonah in a fish that was prepared. If you read the scripture, it was not a whale. God prepared the fish. The reason for that, the fish went to the bottom of the ocean and Jonah was able to feel the pressure of the challenge in Nineveh. He had to feel the pressure of what was taking place in the heavens because of Nineveh. And after three days and night experiencing that level of pressure, going to preach in Nineveh was easier, less pressure for him than being under the ocean. Because Nineveh as a city was a prophet killer. All prophets going to Nineveh were killed before they got there. And they would be, uh, some of their skulls would be placed on rods and Nineveh would say, this is what we do with prophets. And so Jonah didn't want to go there, not because he was disobedient. He didn't want his head on a stake. Because he knows what Nineveh does to prophets. But God put a message in Jonah's spirit that was so simple. It was eight words. Eight is the number of new beginnings. Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. Eight words, the number of new beginnings. I'm giving Nineveh a chance, a new beginning, through a prophet that has experienced the most pressure ever. And so of all the prophets, Jesus is compared to Jonah because Jesus was under the most excruciating pressure because as God made flesh in the earth, 
the pressure of sin from Adam to the last man was pressing and crushing him on every side. Is everybody tracking with me? Everyone say pressure. pressure. Be careful what you wish for. Because whatever you get from what you wish for is coming with significant levels of pressure. You've got to say amen. amen. So let's talk about the World Cup. Last week I wore orange. Uh, I had to put my orange suit away yesterday. I had an orange suit, Shamari, that I'm telling you. And so Virgil van Dijk, the Netherlands captain, was taking captain's duties because uh, who wants to take the first penalty? And so Virgil went and took the first penalty. And so the pressure of staying in the World Cup to the next round, facing a goal with a goalkeeper to score a penalty. All of your country, your teammates, your supporters around the world are depending on you to score that goal. As the goalkeeper, there are people depending on you. And a lot of times you see guys when they are walking up to take that penalty, their lips get white, their, their, their mouths lose saliva, uh, they, they, their legs become like, like, like jelly. It's because of... If you look at a coach who a nation has put all their hopes and dreams on, Put your hands together for Morocco if you're an African. Can you imagine the pressure on a coach to deliver? And then when a coach makes a sub and he brings on somebody that you think shouldn't be on, don't you think that coach is feeling the pressure? If you have a business and you are employing 10 people and sales are bad and down, and now it's the end of the year, your employees are expecting a salary and a bonus and leave and a Christmas present and a chicken and a cake waza and petrol in your car and a hairdo and a pedicure and a man, I mean, a, 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 a manicure, a manicure. <laughs> Come on, Raphael, amen. Show some leg. The thing is here, for everything, action and non-action produces pressure. And so, Sir Isaac Newton, one of my favorite inventors of, of all time, uh, deals with, with uh, movement and action. And he makes this statement, he says, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Say that. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So non-action is an action. It rebounds back to you that way. So when I put my hand this way, when I put my hand this way, my body is moving in an opposite direction. If you shoot a rifle or a pistol, the kickback is at equal force as what is going forward. And so as you are pushing your life forward, God said to Moses, tell the people we are going forward. But by going forward, there's an equal and opposite reaction. It's forcing Egypt, Pharaoh, to empty out and follow you because there is an equal and opposite reaction. So when you get a breakthrough in the heavens through your prayers and your believing, and God opens the windows of heaven for you. That's the action. The opposite action is a demonic force mobilizing against you to test if you are strong enough to handle the blessing. If you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. That's the action. Jesus' equal and opposite reaction was, man does not live by bread alone. Jesus didn't say, I don't have to do that. I don't. He, he presented an equal 
an opposite reaction. And so remember this. You don't have to strike somebody when they strike you. Because the equal and opposite reaction when they hit you on the cheek and you turn the other. What's happening in that violator's life? The equal and opposite reaction can be deferred to a season they least expect. So when the enemy comes in and hits you hard, Jesus said, don't curse your enemy. Because their action has activated an equal and opposite reaction. And what will happen is that it's going to come back as a blessing for you and as a curse for them. Everyone say pressure. Everyone say pressure. And so for, for, for your success, whatever it is, success is not free. Someone has put themselves under pressure to get that to you. And so let's look at types of pressure. There's fluid pressure. And through, so through the process of osmosis, fluid will move through a membrane from one area of great pressure to where there's void and emptiness. And so when you are void and empty, there's a simple membrane where the provision of God over here will start moving provision to you over here. And the way that provision moves is through your spirit man. It's a membrane. And if your spirit is disturbed, isn't it amazing that trouble starts before you get to church and immediately after church, everything is fine. Now you and your wife are in the car and something happens and he... <laughs> because what's happening is the, the, the spirit world on the evil side wants to muddy up your spirit confuse your spirit because there is a transfer that's wanting to take place through osmosis from where there's much to where there's little. And so prepare your spirit before you come to church. And when you leave church, guard your spirit because someone can offend you right outside there. It's called the birds of the air that steal from you so that the word of God doesn't take root in your spirit. And so guard that because the devil is a shrewd and evil spirit. And so there is uh, explosion or uh, deflagration pressures. There's negative pressure, stagnation pressure, vapor pressure, and so on and so forth. Now, let's deal with pressure to perform. I'm just doing my, my groundwork and we'll get there. Let's deal with pressure to perform. And you, I'll use my life as a simple example. All, all the world, William Shakespeare said in his sonnet, As You Like It, somewhere in there says, all the world's a stage and every man and woman, we are players. We have our entrance and our exit. And so when you come into the world, you are expected to perform. From the very beginning, that baby arrives, the baby is expected to perform. When the baby cries, that's when they say the baby's fine. If the baby doesn't cry, they may be a challenge. And so at the birth of that baby, perform. You as a mother, you have to perform. You have to plug that baby into the source of life. If that baby is not nibbling, uh, there's something wrong. And so the baby has to perform, the mother has to perform. And so the doctors around have to perform. Hopefully the husband will help with nappies and burping and crying at night. You know, when, when Dreen was born, my pastor asked me a question, said, uh, how, how is Dreen? I said, ah, Dreen's such a good baby. He sleeps all night. And Chichi was like rolling her eyes because I was like, <sighs> and Dream was up every hour and a half and so on. But the thing is that with your life, from the day you arrive, you are expected to perform. From grade one, 
you are expected to perform. Your parents then tell you, tell, you know, oh, this is Jamie. Uh, Jamie's going to be a doctor. Jamie's going to be a lawyer. Jack's going to be a business person. And so as a child, you are hearing that. And so performance then is not based on your ability, your gift, your capability. Your performance is then based on pleasing someone who has an expectation on you that may be not realistic. And so people then are under pressure from a young age. Children sometimes struggle because of unrealistic pressure placed on their lives from parents, teachers, peers. And so only one child can come first in class. And if it's not your child, don't make that child feel like a vomited dog's dinner. There is validity. And if you have several children, and there's one that comes first and one that comes 51st in a class of 51. Don't make the one that comes 51st feel bad and the one that comes first feel better. Because in our world, there are no failures. There's only processes. The one that's first and the one that's 51st all have to go through a process. And so the one that comes first to 51st we may have to lay a different track on their platform so they can perform according to their ability. So the Bible says, to whom much is, so the pressure to whom much is given, you guys are so boring, much is, and so when you have great talent, okay, Newton's law, for every action, great talent, there's an equal and opposite reaction, there's great performance. So if you have five talents, we want five talents from you. You have two talents, we want two talents from you. You have one talent, don't bury it. We want one talent from you. Put your money with, the, with, with investors. If you are a one talent person, you are still expected to perform. There's no excuse to say, I'm a woman, I'm black, I'm young, I'm old, I'm round, I'm tall, my head's too big, my head's too small. None of that. You are expected to perform. And you have to put pressure on yourself to perform in your lane. Shout, I'm expected to perform. Of course you are expected to perform. You give according to your ability. You worship according to your gift. Amen. We are all covered. You are supposed to clap your hands, all ye people. You are supposed to shout unto God. Make a joyful noise. Dancing is never prescribed as choreography, choreographer dancing where, you know, that does help. But for people that can't dance, you can still praise his name in the dance. You can still make a joyful noise. You can still clap your hands. Those things you can do because that's a level playing field. And so there are times in your life, please don't bring, bring people up here that can't sing. Even if they say, oh, it's always been my desire to sing. No, you stay there and make money. And so this microphone, when it works, according to who's on the desk, the louder I get, the system is built to where if I shout, there is what is called a compressor. Where when I make my voice loud, that compressor grabs my voice and puts it in a way where it doesn't blow the highs or the mediums in the speaker. Because there are three ranges in a speaker. There are lows, there are mids, there are highs. And so when the highs blow, you then can't hear the treble sound on the top. And those intricate sounds that go into the inner ear become impeded. And so then there has to be balance so that there's not too much output from the amplifier onto a limited, probably, speaker or carrier. Pressure. You can't take uh, electricity straight out of Kariba when it's working, duh, and put it into a cable on your kettle. 
you have to manage what pressure is coming from the hydroelectric power station and you have to match it with cable that can be broken down in a transformer where there's less pressure on your kettle or your iron. And so what God does for you, no man can see God and live. That's way too much pressure. And so God designs it to where you see him as he sees you. We all see God differently, but you are designed to receive from God in the service what your cable can handle. And so then you have to grow your cable. The bigger your cable, the more power you can get. If you keep your cable thin, you're only going to be a little kettle. You're never able to boil your life out of any situation. Now, let me start closing. Let me start closing. For the blessing of God on your life, pressure is required. And so, Abraham, you are going to be a father. So, God tells you that at the age of 70. And so, men that don't have a promise in Abraham's camp start having children. The Bible says in, four, in 14, verse 14 of Genesis that Abram had 318 men born in his household. So here you are as a man, Abraham, the friend of God. You have a promise. You're going to have a child. Here are people that don't have a promise. They are having children. Now, when you are in that kind of dilemma, there's pressure to question the word of God. God, how is it that you promised me to be a millionaire and I'm walking, and my next door neighbor is, is a womanizer, or whatever, whatever, and he just bought a third Range Rover. Don't question God. Expand the mechanism to receive. <laughs> Stay with me. And so years later, all of those men, 318, none of them are named. They had families. None of their children are named. They, they had generations. We don't even know if they exist on the earth. But if you take a trip around the city, you'll find Jewish men and women with businesses. You can go to any country, you'll find Abraham's offspring. You go to Israel, they are there, they are building, they are taking land, occupying land, building settlements, so on and so forth. They are some of the most brilliant minds, the wealthiest people in the earth. From a man who endured pressure, for 30 years and when he endured the pressure and after that when God said give your son he endured the pressure and God said now I know in blessing I'll bless you in, in multiplying I will multiply you so when pressure comes no blessing is on the way someone say yes someone say yes now, when God wants to multiply your life in a short space of time, he's not going to allow the agents and the elements of life to, to get the pressure to mold you. He puts you in what is called a pressure cooker. And so meat, generally, if it's oxtail, will take maybe two hours, two and a half hours, three hours, depending on where the ox is from, <laughs> to, to boil soft. But if you have guests arriving in less than an hour, you are going to have to take your life and put it into a pressure cooker. Which means now the heat is increased, the lid is put on there, and so all the pressure of 10 years is now put into one hour. But I'll tell you what, with all that pressure, put it into your life. In one hour, you are accelerated into 10 years. People are, are going to wonder what happened to you in there. So Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, you've refused to bow down to Nebuchadnezzar. And you've said to Nebuchadnezzar, we're not bowing down. For our God is able to deliver us from your hand. But if not, we're not bowing down 
Nebuchadnezzar said, I'm going to increase the pressure seven times. The foolish king didn't know he was accelerating their blessing. That fire was hot enough to melt gold. And so when he raised the pressure to cook these boys, he was allowing three of them to gather together in a pressure cooker in the name of the Lord. And Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So in the middle of a pressure cooker, they accelerated the time for the Messiah to come in the earth. They pulled Jesus from the New Testament all the way into the book of Daniel because they were able to handle pressure. If you will handle pressure, God will accelerate your life. Shout this value in pressure. The greater the pressure, the greater my performance, the greater the pressure, the greater the release on my life. If God has something better for me and I lose something here, if I wait on the Lord and be of good courage, he will make a way for me. I will mount up as wings of angels. Shout amen on wings of eagles. I shall run and not be weary. I shall walk and not faint. I'm taking the pressure. I'm going higher. I'm going to the next level. Don't feel sorry for me when you see me in a pressure cooker. Get ready to receive from my overflow. You've got to clap your hands if you have to. Shout yes. yes. And so Jesus is on his way to meet a need of a leader of the synagogue by name Jairus. He said, can you heal my daughter? She's dying of a sickness. Jesus said, I will come. And so word got out that Jesus is in a healing mood. And so everything that needed healing started to put pressure on him. But Jesus knew how to handle pressure because in the beginning was the word. The word made all things. There was pressure for him to say, let there be light. There was pressure for him to sort out the darkness and the void. There was pressure for him to separate the land and the sea. There was pressure for him to fill the ocean with fish. There was pressure for him to put seeds in the fruit. There was pressure on him to bring living creatures. There was pressure on him to create a man. There was pressure on him to build a garden. There was pressure on him to bring a helpmate. There was pressure on him to deal with fallen man. There was pressure on him to deal with Cain killing Abel. There was pressure on him to help Noah build an ark so Jesus could handle pressure because he's from the Old Testament to the New. So this moment with everybody putting pressure on him, Jesus could handle the pressure. Shout, I can handle the pressure. Give someone a high five. Say, handle the pressure. Say, handle the pressure. If you can handle pressure, you're going to pull someone that's been in isolation for 12 years with no hope, with incurable conditions, because you can handle pressure. You're taking somebody who's been under pressure for 12 years and just touching your clothes will ease their pressure. Just touching your life will soften their dilemma. Shout, I'll handle the pressure because of what's coming. 
for those around me. Clap your hands, everybody. Stand, let's pray. They keep on flashing. I'm 13 minutes over time. Raise your hand. Say, Father, I'm under pressure. I'm under pressure. I'm under pressure. I'm under so much pressure to build Kingdom Cathedral. Something we had started 22 years ago. I'm under so much pressure. And a birthday coming to turn 66 in three and a half weeks is adding even more pressure. Because there are voices that are saying to me, ah, you, you'll never enjoy that building. You'll never enjoy that building. It's pressure. I'm under so much pressure because I'm married to a teenage, a teenage woman. I, I saw Chi Chi dancing here in the first service. I said, my friend, you are under pressure. Three grandchildren, that's pressure. Living in Zimbabwe, that's pressure. This magnificent church, pressure. So it looks like we're having a conference. We may not have a conference. If we have a conference, it's going to cost so much. We can use that money for the church building. But if we use that money for the church building, we're going to lose the glorious experience of a conference. That's pressure. So what do we do? Can we do both? I'm sure we can. Because if you are a five talent person, you can. Somebody told me earlier that they finished their A-levels and that they're now going to university. The pressure that's coming from uni is not like A-level. But I want you to know that A-level is not easy on a 17-year-old. And so I pray for everybody under pressure that God would give you grace. 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 Zimbabwe's got an election here coming up next year. That's pressure. Are we dollarizing? Are we not dollarizing? Are we using bond money? It's pressure. Because how do you invest? How do you plan? Uh, Put a, a strategic plan for your business for 2023 when, when money is constantly changing. When, when, and I think you understand the angle, it's just pressure. If you are able and if you are willing, say, Heavenly Father, help me to handle the press. Everything is pushing on me and pulling on me. Teach me focus. Help me to focus on my assignment. Help me to focus on my calling. Help me to focus on my gifting. Help me to focus on my training. Help me to focus on my generations. Now look at me now. Look at me now. Jesus was busy when Jairus came. He was busy when Jairus came. Jairus was under pressure because his only child was dying. She was 12 years old. Jesus said, I'm on my way. Now, can you imagine when somebody comes, touch Jesus' garment in the press, she had to press, she had to be under pressure, in pressure to touch Jesus. And so she gets healed and Jesus says, who touched me? The disciples are about, everybody's banging on you. He said, no, life has left me. He stopped. Now imagine, imagine, he stops and you are Jairus. And your answer has stopped, hindering your answer to prayer. Your provider to answer your prayer has now been interrupted. And he's talking to this woman. And Jairus said, come on, come on, come on, come on. 
come on, come on. We need this money now. We need it yesterday. We need this building. We need this product. I need this. Come on, come on. You, Ambuya, what's wrong with you? But Jesus needed to heal this older woman. Because Timothy said, the older women must teach the younger women. So the older woman needed to be healed first so that she could help the younger woman that was going to be healed. So even though Jesus is under pressure, he's focusing on first things first. Because if he heals the younger woman and this one dies, there'll be nobody to train the next generation. So we heal our generation to fix the next generation. Raise your hand. Father, we thank you for great grace. Great grace. 